Chronicles of Sri Lankan Moors The Muslims of Sri Lanka have been an intrinsic part of the Sri Lankan community since the advent of Islam and the exploration of Arab, Indian, Persian and other Muslim traders to the island. Sri Lanka has been known by many names. The island was called Serendib in Arabic, which indicates Jewel Island. Showing the existence of the island has been known to Arabs since a long period of time. There have been Muslims in Sri Lanka for well over a thousand years. Historical records indicate the Arab trading presence in the island's coastal belt even before the origin of Islam. It was said the relationship in between the Arab traders and the natives of the island were extremely cordial. The Romans discovered the commercial value of Sri Lanka in the 1st century AD and the island was visited by Greeks, Romans, Persians, Arabs and Chinese traders. Some of the trading commodities of Sri Lanka at that time were cinnamon, precious stones, pearls, elephants and ivory. The abatement of the Roman Empire in the 3rd century AD had a periodic decline in the Roman trade and the Arabs and Persians filled up the vacuum, engaging in a rapidly flourishing intercoastal trade. After the triumph of Persia, Syria and Egypt, the Arabs controlled all the important ports and trading stations between East and West. The Arabs from the Gulf had been coming straight to the island for trade and the significant migration for settlement came via the Malabar coast in what is now Kerala. This brings to our mind the stories of the legendary Sinbad. The first Muslim merchants and sailors may have landed on Sri Lankan shores during the incipient era of Islam. The first Mohammedans reached Ceylon were the members of the House of Ashim who fled in the face of the persecution of the tyrannical caliphates in the early part of the 8th century. The early Arab traders who visited Ceylon settled in the coastal belt of Ceylon, concentrating mainly in the southwestern towns of the country. However, the traces of Arab links with Ceylon were evident well before the chronicles were penned. Sulaiman, an Arab trader and explorer, recounts his visit to Ceylon in 850 AD and mentioned a pilgrimage to Adam's Peak. One cannot think of an Arabian, ignorant of the language of the indigenous inhabitants of a country, unlike its people in every respect in regard to habits, customs, diet, and observances, undertaking a long and perilous journey into the heart of an unknown country. This surely suggests that the Arabs had been in the country for some time and they were known to the inhabitants of Ceylon and wielded influence and were therefore permitted to travel far into the interior in safety and comfort. Fifty years later, in the year 900 AD, it's narrated of another Arab named Abu Zaid who supports the stories of Cosmas and Sulaiman and describes the still flourishing port of Kala, now known as Gaul. Zaid's narrations are based on the experiences of other travelers, one of whom was Ibn Wahhab, who included Serendib in his travels. Wahhab, like his predecessors, made careful observations and collected much information regarding ancient Lanka, for he is able to tell us that the Mayarata, or Pepper country, one of the three oldest divisions of Ceylon was situated between Gaul on the coast and the Ruhuna Rata in the southeast. The Moor settlement in the coastal belt of Ceylon concentrated mainly in the southwestern towns of the country, and it's noted the first Muslim settlement was in a port settlement in western Sri Lanka, which was named Berberine, now known as Beruela, in honor of the Berber traveler who founded the city. And the second settlement was in an area called Alutgamavidia, which was subsequently named Darga Town in the 1940s 
by the Muslims of that town. The mosque in Berowala has archaeological evidence pointing to its historical origins. The third settlement in the region was in Veligama, a town further to the south of Berberin. This city was known by its Arab name as As-Salawat. The biggest massacre of Muslims in the island by the Portuguese was committed here at Veligama, where at least 10,000 Arab soldiers and their families were slaughtered mercilessly by the Portuguese who were renowned for their barbarity towards those who refused to convert to Christianity. The family names of the current Muslims in the region affirm the early ancestry. Habituated to the local conditions in various ways, the Muslims contributed extensively with their talents, wealth, and assisted to the development and progress of the country in a peaceful and comfortable manner, integrating with the society and blending with the local environment. By about the 10th century, the Arab trading societies were well established in Sri Lanka, especially in the island's coastal towns, enjoying the favor of the rulers and maintaining cordial relations with the local inhabitants. The Sinhalese in that era were not interested in trade and were appeased in agriculture and raising livestock. Trade was thus wide open to the Muslims. The Sinhalese kings considered the Muslim settlements favorably on account of the revenue that they brought them through their contacts overseas, both in trade and in politics. History accounts up to the 14th century, the Sinhalese were not familiar with mass-scale spinning and weaving of cloth. Of course, there were the ancient handloom and distaff, but the production was insufficient to meet the requirements of the entire population. Accordingly, they had to depend on India for their clothing. During this time, the Sinhalese king delivered manifestos, granting rewards to any individual who would go over to India and bring some skilled craftsmen for the purpose of introducing the art of manufacture of cloth in Ceylon. About this time, a Moorman of Beruela, motivated by the tempting offers, made the voyage across Palk Strait and brought with him a batch of eight weavers of the Salagama caste from a place called Salia Patanam. As the story continues, the eight persons referred to were drugged and secured on board, and that they only realized they were being transported to a foreign country when they had been many miles out at sea. It is stated that two of the victims, rather than being the subjects of such deception, jumped overboard and were never heard of again. The remaining weavers were granted a cordial welcome upon their arrival in Ceylon. In due course, they were presented to the king, who treated them with every kindness in order to induce them to commence practicing their craft locally. They were at the instance of the court, married to women of distinction and given houses and lands. A manufactory was established for them in the vicinity of the royal palace. The courtesy and avail of the Moors attracted themselves into royal favor. This acquired them a higher authority which they used to bestow their ability to the fullest within their territory along the sea coast. There is also a report in the history of Sri Lanka of a Muslim ruler, Vatami Raja, who reigned at Kuronegala, North Central Province in the 14th century. This factor cannot be found in history books due to their omission for reasons unknown by modern authors. Vatami Raja was the son of King Bhuvanaka Bahu I by a Muslim spouse, the daughter of one of the chiefs. The Singhali son of King Bhuvanaka Bahu I, Parakrama Bahu III, the real heir to the throne, was crowned at Dambadenia under the name of Pandita Parakrama Bahu III. In order to be rid of his stepbrother, Vatami Raja, he ordered that his eyes be gouged out. It is held that the author of the Mahabansa, Ancient History of Ceylon, had suppressed the recording of this disgraceful incident. The British translator Mudalir Vijay Singha states that the original Ola leaf script was bodily removed from the writings and fiction inserted instead. The blinded Vatami Raja also known as Bhuvanaka Bahu II or Alconer, 
abbreviated from a Langar corner, meaning chief of Lanka of Alageshvara, was seen by the Arab traveler Ibn Battuta during his visit to the island in 1344. His son named Parakramabahu II, Alageshvara II, was also a Muslim. The lineage of Alageshvara kings of Muslim origin ended in 1410. Although all the kings during this reign may not have been Muslims, the absence of the prefix Sri Sangha Bodhi pertaining to the disciples of the Buddha to the name of these kings on the rock inscriptions during this hundred year period may be considered as an indicator that they were not Buddhists. Further, during Ibn Battuta's visit, a Muslim ruler called Jalasti is reported to have been holding Kalambo, maintaining his hold over the town with the garrison of about 500 Abyssinians. Colonial Sri Lanka The influx of Portuguese in 1505 afflicted the Muslims in their status from which they never again recovered as the Portuguese regarded them as their adversary in trade and enemies in faith. When the Portuguese first appeared on Sri Lankan shores, the Muslims warned the king, Sangha, nobles, and the people of the potential threat to the country's sovereignty. The contest between these Portuguese and the Moors was an unequal one, as the Portuguese were trained and disciplined soldiers conversant with well-equipped weapons and modern war methods unheard of by the peaceful and industrious Moor. History records, while the Portuguese tried to gain a foothold in Colombo, the Muslims even provided firearms, fought side by side with the Sinhalese, and even used their influence with South Indian powers to get military assistance to the Sinhalese rulers. The Portuguese expelled the Muslims from Colombo and forbade the worship of any other religion. Installing themselves in Colombo, the Portuguese commenced a vigorous campaign of the cross. The Moors were subjected to every torture and humiliation. The Moors made a huge effort to recapture their fort, carrying on a powerful attack, keeping the foreigners absent for a short time. Following a fearless fight on the part of the Moors, they were forced to own defeat, owning to the superiority of arms and power the Portuguese possessed. Motivated by this success and fearing a consequent attack, Portuguese proceeded to erect a factory and rebuild the old mud fort of the Moors. The fort was entirely rebuilt with stone. Both the Sinhalese and the Moors did everything that was possible to prevent the work being carried out, but were brutally defeated. Raja Singha II, the king of Kandy, desiring to get rid of the Portuguese, who ruled most of the coastal area of the island, made a treaty with the Dutch in 1638 who at that time had the largest merchant fleet in the world. The main conditions of the treaty were that the Dutch should deliver the coastal areas they capture to the Candian king, and the king should grant the Dutch a monopoly over trade on the whole island. The agreement was branched by both parties. However, the consequence came out was only the substitution of one colonial power to another. By 1660, the Dutch controlled the whole island, except the Kingdom of Kandy, and it was not until 1656 that Colombo fell. It was during the Dutch period, the Malays who form a substantial element of the Muslim community came to Ceylon. Almost all of the early Malay immigrants were soldiers posted by the Dutch colonial administration to Sri Lanka who decided to settle on the island. More immigrants added, as the convicts or members of noble houses from Indonesia who were exiled to Sri Lanka and never left. When the Dutch capitulated to the British, the Malay soldiers joined the British troops and settled in Ceylon. Their separate identity has been preserved by the Malay language, which includes numerous words absorbed from Sinhalese and the Moorish variant of the Tamil. When the Dutch appeared and persecuted the Muslims in their coastal settlements, the Muslims ran to the Candian Kingdom. Senarat and Raja Singha II settled these Muslims in the eastern coast. 
The Dutch, who abolished the former as rulers of the seaboard, were not prepared to give the Muslims even a small share of their commercial gains, and therefore announced harsh regulations to keep them down. A regulation was passed prohibiting the residents of Moors within the vicinity of the towns of Gaul, Matara, and Beligama. This was at the time that Gaul was the chief port of call for the island, as well as Matara and Beligama were also important trade centers. Difficulties which this law enforced on the trade of the Moors were excessively afflicting them. The Dutch tactfully ruined the business of their rivals wherever possible, and during their 140th year rule, the Dutch, like the Portuguese, made repeated unsuccessful attempts to bring candy under their control. The British ejected the Dutch in 1796, and in 1802, Sri Lanka became a crown colony. In 1815, the British won control of candy. The British did not follow the abhorring conversion policy carried out by the Portuguese towards the cross. Nor were the British as rough as the Dutch in their financial exploitations. Around 1804, the alliance between the Sinhalese king and the maritime government was so confined that an outbreak of hostilities was expected. It was therefore considered unwise to regulate the payment of the head tax and thereby antagonize the Moors who could be of service to the British in countless ways, point out Lorna Devaraja in her book. As in India, the Muslims became a powerful weapon in the hands of the British, an ally who could be used to their advantage to undermine the power and influence of the King of Kandy. Governor Frederick North's proclamation of 1799 preserving the laws applicable to the Muslims and the code of the Muhammadian law affected in 1806 was an attempt to convince the Muslims of their separate identity. Even the abolition of the Paul tax on the Muslims imposed by the Dutch, which Governor North described as an oppressive and disgraceful tax on an industrious race was motivated not by purely humanitarian considerations. It is also stated that Ceylon Moors were for the first time appointed to native ranks. One of the earliest of these was Haji of Balasi, the distinguished though little known Moor. A more popular individual was Uduman Lebbe Marikar Sheikh Abdul Qadir, the grandfather of the late ILM Abdul Aziz, who in his day was a prominent member of the Moorish community. Seika di Marikar, by which his name was better known, was appointed the head Moorman of Colombo by Sir Robert Brownig on June 10, 1818. Several other appointments followed soon afterwards, and the Moors were not only made chiefs in different parts of the maritime provinces but also assigned in the public service. As mentioned in the preceding part, the Muslims in the coastal settlements ran to the Candian Kingdom as the Dutch tortured them in all channels. Senator 1604-1635 and Raja Singha II 1635-1687 settled these Muslims. Lorna Devaraja states it is also possible that the Muslims who were trading in the kingdom from the 17th century at least were already associated with the Madige. At that time, the fisherfolk were affiliated to it. The Singhala king, in his capacity as head of the economic and social order, had the power to assign economic functions and grant lands if he thought fit to any group of people extraneous or indigenous and incorporate them to the Bada system. In this process, the fisher forks were absorbed into Singhala society, but the Muslims were not thus acculturated because they clung tenaciously to their faith, but they functioned technically like a caste group. Devaraja, page 88.
in the reign of Kirti Sri Rajasingha, Sheikh Alim, a Muslim, was appointed Madige Bada, or Transport Department, Nilame. And after him, his grandson, Sheikh Abdul Qadir, held the same office. Later, Makula Muhandiram, a Muslim, was Madige Disev of the Seven Koralays. Since the Madige Department included both Sinhalese and Muslims, here we find an example of Muslims rising to high offices of authority over the Sinhalese through their association with the Bada system. Obviously, race and religion were no consequence when it came to appointments. Although it is generally believed that the Muslims are versed only in the arts of trade and commerce, it will be seen that there were other areas in which they excelled, one of which was medicine. Certain Sri Lankan Muslim families had distinguished physicians among their members who rose to preeminence in the profession. In addition, Muslims also functioned as weavers, tailors, and lapidarists. A Muslim physician, Sultan Kutia, who was originally practicing medicine in Gaul, was invited to the Candian court, taken into royal service, and given land near Gampala, where his descendants lived till 1874, and were known as Gaul, Vedarala, or the physician from Gaul. Although one cannot be sure about the numbers, it is reasonable to assume that there was a drift of Muslims to the interior in the 18th century as well. They made the Candian Kingdom their base and traveled up and down for purposes of trade when conditions were not unfavorable. The first generation of immigrants married Candian women and their offsprings who invariably socialized as Muslims, either intermarried among themselves or married new immigrants of the same faith. So with each generation, the Islamic identity was maintained and strengthened. Devaraja, page 97 and page 123. Muslims as functionaries in the Dalada Maligava, or the Temple of the Tooth. The Muslims were involved in the functioning of the Dalada Maligava. The service tenure register of the Kandy district prepared in 1872 gives the names of the several Muslims who were occupying service shares belonging to the Maligava in return for service. The Dalada Maligava owned extensive lands called Maligagam and the administration of these lands entirely in the hands of a lay officer called the Diyabadana Nilame, appointed by the king from the Radala aristocracy. So in a large non-monetary economy, the services rendered to the Maligava were paid by the grants of land. The supply of salt and dried fish could be considered as a purely utilitarian service rendered by the Muslims and involved no religious or cultural significance. Two Muslims, Muhammad Labbe and Uduman Labbe, occupied the Lunudena Panguva, the share that supplies salt of the village of Palle Gampaha Kahavatta, belonging to the Dalada Maligava. The service attached to the share was to supply the Maligava with 20 measures of good clean salt for the New Year festival. It is clear from the foregoing that Muslims were involved in the administrative and ritual aspects of the functioning of the Dalada Maligava. Devaraja, page 103 to page 107. The tradition connected with the Kahata Pitya Mosque near Gampala further illustrates the munificence of the Sinhala kings towards the Muslims. The site where the mosque now stands was a wasteland with few trees. According to tradition, an ascetic from Mecca sat here in meditation and his dignified, motionless posture struck the attention 
of a toddy tapper who had come to tap the palm tree. In order to ascertain whether this figure was alive or dead, the tapper is said to have sliced off the tip of his nose. The ascetic remained motionless. The following morning, the toddy tapper was astonished to see the piece he had cut off reattached to the nose. The tapper was overawed and related his experience to the king Bhuvanaka Bahu IV, who visited the ascetic and asked him what he needed. Only a strip of land to lay my head on, was the reply. When the king wished to know the extent required, the ascetic threw his bangle, called the Sakkara Valalla, in four directions and indicated the area. This was granted and the area is still known as Sakkaran Kotuva. The saint Baba Kuf was deified and a tomb was built in his memory. Later, a mosque sprung up on the same place and it continues to be a well-known place of pilgrimage. Also, many lands have been granted to more men representing high authority within the kingdom. The Linde Kotua Gedera granted to Abdul Quddus in Gampala and several other offerings made to dignitaries shows how the Kandyan king showed remarkable contributions and tolerance towards the Muslims. There are several Muslim families in the Udurata even today bearing the family names Muhandiram Lage, Vidana Lage, and Lekam Ge, all of which signify their official connections in the past. And as we examine this long odyssey of Ceylon Moors, it reveals a kind of saga where the foundation of an old community has been laid by early Arab traders.